So good afternoon, everyone here in Glasgow. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to people who are joining us virtually from all over the world. It is an honor to welcome you all to the COP26 side event on partnership to strengthen transparency for core innovation, PASTI, in this special setting. I am Riki Nakajima from OECC, the Overseas Environmental Corporation Center Japan. I will be the MC for this, today's event. Nice to meet you all. This side event, titled Towards Strengthening Transparency Activities by the Private Sectors, from the experience of partnership to strengthen transparency for core innovation in Asia, is organized by the Minister, Ministry of Environment Japan, and secretarial support is given by the OECC, the implementation agency of, for the PASTI initiative. I would like to invite everyone to save your questions and comments to the end, as we will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of this event. Before we begin with the sessions, I have the pleasure of introducing His Excellency, Minister Yamaguchi Tsuyoshi, the Minister of the Environment Japan, for the opening remarks. Your Excellency, may I invite you to the podium? Thank you very much. Your mic is yours. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Yamaguchi, Environment Minister of Japan. I would like to welcome all of you joining this side event on strengthening transparency activities by the private sectors. The world seems to have entered an era of great competition for next net zero. And the government of Japan has committed to the long-term goal of achieving net zero by 2050. Japan has been actively supporting developing countries to reach net zero. Our support ranges from the formulation of policies to implementation of projects for decarbonization. They are sometimes provided as a package. Among the different types of support, I would like to highlight the importance of transparency. In order to effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it is essential for each entity to monitor and report GHG emissions from its own business activities. Transparency is also crucial for sustainable corporate governance. Nowadays, more and more investors require disclosure of climate change-related information from companies, and therefore measuring and disclosing emissions data is becoming critical to attract investment. Japan has a legal framework obliging major emitting companies to measure and report GHG emissions. This has successfully raised awareness among companies. In fact, Japan ranks the top of the world in terms of the number of companies supporting TCFD. We have been sharing our experience of this kind with ASEAN member states and are providing training pre programs. Today, I would like to upgrade our cooperation program to a new stage. We will propose during today's discussion to develop ASEAN regional guidelines for greater GHG transparency. The outline will be discussed later. I am very much looking forward to the discussion held by today's distinguished guest speakers and panelists. Comments on the guideline will be highly appreciated so that we can make the project more effective leading to greater transparency. I sincerely hope that today's side event will be a fruitful one and that greater transparency of corporate activities in Asia will contribute greatly for greater transparency on the global scale. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much for your kind words and for your informative opening address. Next, I am honored to introduce Her Excellency Ms. Grace Fu, the Minister of Sustainability and the Environment Singapore, for her opening remarks. 
Minister Yamaguchi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to join you this afternoon at the COP26 Japan Pavilion. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned us that unless there are rapid and deep emission cuts, global temperatures will exceed 2 degrees Celsius in this century. And to keep 1.5 degrees C alive, we need to keep carbon emissions in this decade. While bolder country commitments have come forward at COP26, we need pledges to be backed by concrete actions and implementation plans and reporting for the NDC's achievements by the countries. This is why the tracking of greenhouse gas emissions is important. When countries' emissions are accurately captured, we can have a clear basis for implementation to track progress. A robust monitoring, reporting and verification MRV regime is also the foundation of an effective carbon pricing scheme. It ensures that the cost of carbon emission is properly factored in our production. When Singapore implemented a carbon tax in 2019, we set up the national MRV regime to accurately determine the levels of taxable emissions across different sectors of the economy. The regime is robust, but does not impose a disproportionate reporting burden on the companies. As part of the capability building process, we conducted briefings to companies to familiarise them with the MRV requirements. We also grew the pool of third-party verifiers so that verification services are available at competitive prices. MRV regimes also provide confidence for countries and companies to work together on low carbon technologies and solutions and develop high integrity carbon markets. Such collaboration must be built on robust carbon accounting frameworks under the guidance of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement and will require the development of new infrastructure, tools and capabilities. In this context, the partnership to strengthen transparency for cool innovation, or PASTI for short, is a significant initiative. PASTI is the brainchild of the Japan Ministry of Environment. In partnership with the Japan Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center, OECC, Singapore's National Environment Agency, NEA, oversees the project collaboration with funding support from the Japan ASEAN Integration Fund. The project aims to develop and implement monitoring and reporting systems for greenhouse gas emissions for industry facilities across ASEAN member states. Thanks to the support provided by the ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change, Phase 1 was completed in July last year. More than 40 partners across ASEAN member states, comprising government and corporate representatives, participated in the needs assessment and development of an implementation roadmap which will harmonise MNR system in the region. Phase 2, which we are launching today, will build on this foundation. It will establish facility-level MNR guidelines that are applicable for the region and test drive these guidelines through pilot projects. If successfully implemented, this proof of concept will support facilities and businesses in their decarbonisation journeys and make their operations more sustainable. Companies stand to reap efficiency gains by incorporating emissions considerations in designing and running their facilities. And to facilitate transparency, a third-party verification mechanism can be added to create a robust MRV system that will support the greening of our industries and economies in the global push for a low-carbon, climate-resilient future. Collective and committed global action is needed to overcome climate change. Singapore is keen to cooperate with other like-minded partners for a greener, brighter tomorrow. 
I thank the Ministry of Environment, Japan, for its support and collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your encouraging remarks. I would like to also express my appreciation from, uh, for the continuous support, management, and strong leadership from your government. Thank you very much. And last but not at least, I am honored to introduce His Excellency Ekafab Fantabon, the Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN Social Cultural Community, ASEAN Secretariat, for his opening remarks. We have received a video message from Deputy Secretary General. Please pay attention in, to the screen. Excellency Sugeshi Yamaguchi, Minister of the Environment of Japan. Excellency Graceful, Minister of Sustainability and Development of Singapore. Professor Dr. Kasuhiko Takedemoto, President of the Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center, Japan. Dr. Amida Sasia Alice Jabana, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Excellencies, distinguished panelists and the colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the ASEAN Secretariat, I am extremely grateful and honored to join you today at the UNF Triple C the COP26 side event hosted by the Ministry of the Environment of Japan. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to the organizers for convening this special gathering as we discuss how we can further engage the private sector in the global battle against the climate change. As we have heard in the last few days in Glasgow, there really is an urgent need to collective to confront the ongoing climate crisis. Every day, millions of people that are affected by the serious consequences of the global warming and more to destructive disasters. Unfortunately, the developing world, including ASEAN member states, carries a heavier burden in facing these impacts. A recent study estimates that global warming will expose 3 billion people to too near the unbelievable conditions if no strong actions are done now. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, ASEAN considers climate change as one of its top priorities in our work with the partners, including Japan. In fact, at the 15th ASEAN-Japan Dialogue on Environmental Cooperation last September, the draft ASEAN-Japan Climate Action Agenda 2.0 was endorsed to strengthen the regional and local climate actions, especially on transparency, mitigation, and adaptation. This renewed commitment also to hope to expand ASEAN's climate efforts, especially the laying long-term strategies for net zero transition and decarbonization. Enhancing the transparency and transformative actions are key the pathways to our climate change agenda as recommended in the ASEAN State of the Climate Change Report. Launched last month, the report was the region's first attempt to capture the state of climate change in ASEAN and outlined how we can improve actions to achieve our 2050 climate change targets. The report also underscores the need to further the support the ASEAN member states in raising the climate science capacities through the enhanced access to climate finance and newer technologies. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
I acknowledge the contribution of the government of Japan and the leadership of the OECC in working with the private sector to implement the, of the first phase of the Pasti Jaib Initiative on the development and implementation of a facility level MRV the systems for the greenhouse gas emissions in ASEAN member states. This is was the decide to understand the gaps and needs in adapting, uh, in adopting the monitoring the reports and verification the system at the company level in each ASEAN member state. I am glad to welcome to the project's second phase uh, expected to be implemented uh, later this year. Addressing the climate change requires a collaborative efforts. The commitment of all the stakeholders, including to those uh, from the business sector, is crucial. We need uh, the ASEAN member states' governments' stronger will and action to put in place, enabling the policies and mechanisms to support future initiatives. At the same time, we need to stronger the private sector the engagement to report and monitor their climate actions as a global citizens and responsible businesses. We simply cannot aff afford to execution. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, so today's gathering will allow us to reflect on the possible the avenues of the for cooperation as we champion the climate mitigation and resilience in ASEAN. I highly encourage the ASEAN the member states the private partnership for a just and inclusive climate transition. We need to take bolder the steps to ensure that we can achieve the renewed targets we have set at this year's COP26. Today, it provides us a great opportunity to form a strong bonds in our parts towards a clean and climate resilient ASEAN. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your ex uh, message, Your Excellency. Uh, sorry for the disturbance of the video. The video is recorded and we will have it uh, uh, corrected on when we upload it in, uh, on our YouTube uh, channel. So please be patient. Thank you very much. So as we are still going on, uh, we would like to move on to the session two. Uh, the two, next session, we have uh, two guest speakers who just who you already saw online uh, waiting to waiting for the speeches. Uh, doctor, first, I would like to ask Doctor Amida Salisia Alis Japana, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, to make a speech. Doctor Alis Japana. The, uh, could you turn your screen on and the, uh, turn your mic on? And the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to deliver a keynote speech at this site event on partnership to strengthen transparency for co-innovation or PASTI. tea I know that PASTI aims to enhance co-innovation between the government, non-state actors, and the global community to improve the transparency framework for reducing greenhouse gas emission and to achieve a country's climate goal in its NDCs or nationally determined contribution why is PASTI important? Robust transparency and accountability are two key aspects of the Paris Agreement that have implications for both the government and non-state actors. Unavailability of high quality data and difficulties in collecting, managing, and coordinating data can hinder the government's effort to improve the accuracy of a country's national greenhouse gas 
inventories. The establishment of transparent emission measuring and reporting systems for the private sector is an important contribution towards reaching net zero emission targets. Such systems allow the visualization of emissions by enterprises and can assist in identifying opportunities for decarbonization technologies. Well-developed measurement reporting and verification or MRV systems at the national, subnational and company level are the backbone of Article 4 of the Paris Agreement on the Enhanced Transparency Framework. They support the identification of greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential as well as the development of ambitious targets. Sharing the example of Indonesia, PASTI supports the Ministry of National Development Planning or BAPENAS in developing an integrated and advanced MRV system across ministries that will be used by non-state actors to report their greenhouse gas emission and climate reduction activities. In general, MRE can also allow countries in the ASEAN region to track implementation and achievement of nationally determined contribution or NDCs and report on achievements. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, regionally, MRE system ensure methodological consistency and comparability between the nationally determined contribution or NDCs and more accurate regional assessment of progress. A report by ESCAP and partners released last week on the ambition and potential of NDC commitments of the Asia-Pacific countries has shown that with respect to transparency or MRV, Asia-Pacific countries are generally lag behind. Having said that, and based on the assessment report, countries in the ASEAN subregion scored higher than other sub-region for this enabling factor and have made commitments that have created the basis for establishing a fully operational enhanced transparency framework or ETF. Singapore has earned the status of effective rating, while most of the other ASEAN member states are categorized as capable and engaged. Philippines and Cambodia have excelled by including a gender marker into their MRV systems. Furthermore, the report also underlines that well-developed MRV systems are a prerequisite to gaining the trust of financial institutions and climate funds and enhancing the opportunities for access to climate finance. For the private sector, environmental, social, and governance, or ESG disclosures, are gaining traction and quickly becoming the norm. ESG has been seen as a tool to attract capital, create corporate value, and ESG data can also be used for internal corporate analysis and improvements. The market is shifting rapidly, and transparency is something increasingly demanded by customers and investors. Yet, many companies have expressed concern over inconsistent and incomparable green standards across countries. Such fragmentation is harmful because it can impair the quality of environmental standards as countries compete to green their business sectors. For, firm, for firms themselves, inconsistent green standards would push up the compliance costs. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a transparent emission measuring and reporting system improves credibility at the national level as well, along with access to climate credits for low carbon technology upgrades, which contributes to enhance competitiveness in global supply chain. It can also facilitate access to ESG funds. To access these funds, companies or governments need to pass stringent tests to ensure compliance with the ESG criteria related to environmental, social, and governance factors. Overall, such initiative as PASD would lead to more robust private sector engagement with concrete climate actions to support national carbon neutrality pledges and aspiration. Such alliances are critical for all of us to reach carbon neutrality by the middle of this century. 
Therefore, this initiative of the government of Japan is commendable and will assist the ASEAN member states in realizing higher ambitions. ESCAP stands ready to support further the implementation and promotion of the results of the PASTI initiative for wider regional scale-up and uptake. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alice Jabana. So as the next table speaker, we would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Kazuhiko Takemoto, the president of the Overseas Environmental Corporation Japan, for his keynote speech. Professor Dr. Kazuhiko, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, moderator, Mr. Nakajima. I have prepared the uh, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, could you uh, uh, put uh, them uh, on? Uh, for my presentation. I am pleased to present uh, our regional wide initiative in developing a system to measure and report GHG emissions, which has been built up together with our partner countries in Asia. As uh, uh, Minister Yamaguchi shared with us uh, at the uh, opening. Next slide, please. Today, uh, I would like to share with you these three points shown here. Background and objectives, secondary development of PASTI, and thirdly, toward developing guidelines for measuring and reporting system. Next, please. Now, as a background, uh, let me start with a short history for the Asian, ASEAN Regional Corporation on Transparent Mechanism for Climate Change Actions through ASEAN Summit process. In 2018, the Japanese Prime Minister Abe pledged ASEAN-Japan Climate Action Agenda at the 21st ASEAN-Japan Summit. This action agenda highlighted these three actions, namely transparency, adaptation, and mitigation. In regard to transparency action, the government of Japan has launched a regional program partnership to strengthen transparency for co-innovation or PASTI in short. With co-innovative approaches, by making full use of Japanese experience and expertise. Next slide, please. This figure shows the three objectives of PASTI programs. Namely, number one, to promote engagement of non-state actors with incentive mechanism in climate transparency activities. Secondly, to develop capacities and institutional structures on GHG emission measuring and reporting systems under their national development strategies. And thirdly, to streamline the transparency action in local, national, and regional climate policies. Next slide, please. Local private companies are affected by actions of global companies who are engaged in improving their supply chains and in disclosing climate-related information in order to seek their opportunities to access to ESG finance. It is a business chance for private companies to take climate transparency actions because these actions will be able to improve their business profile. By this profile improvement, private sectors are able to upgrade their own corporate values, which eventually leads us to more sustainable future. Next slide, please. In developing PASTI program, the practical approaches are adopted toward a full-fledged measuring and reporting system. In light of this, 
we have extended a variety of opportunities for the government and the private sectors by making full use of existing tools and mechanisms from policy development level to ground level. PASTI has also provided the stakeholders with the training and the information sharing opportunities at the various stages. Next slide, please. The PASTI program has been developed with two tracks, namely by regional wide cooperation and by lateral cooperation. The regional wide cooperation has been developed through the initiative by the ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change, AWGCC. In this regional activity, we have adopted the bottom-up and the stepwise approaches to enhance the transparency in each ASEAN member states. And bilateral cooperation has been developed so far through the partnership between Japan and three countries, such as Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. We have designed the project in a more flexible manner and supported the partner countries in developing transparency activities according to their national development strategies, national circumstances, and their capacity. We are also looking forward to further expansion of bilateral cooperation with other partner countries. Next slide, please. On regional wide cooperation, by mobilizing the Japan ASEAN Integration Fund, JIF, we are now in transition from its phase one to phase two. In phase one, we developed our roadmap on measuring and reporting system for facilities. We are now about to move to the implementation phase for developing the guidelines and the designing pilot project. At the same time, we are planning to develop information platform as well. Next slide, please. Now, let me share with you my thought for possible guidelines. First, the guidelines were strengthened transparency of GHG emissions with the uh, private sector involvement in a bottom-up manner. Secondly, guidelines will be robust for GHG accounting and consistent with key international standards such as IPCC and GHG protocol. Then they will be flexible according to national circumstances of each country by adopting stepwise approaches, and the fourth, guidelines will provide practical suggestions for policy makers and the GHG reporters. Next slide, please. In developing guidelines, I would like to highlight major elements to consider. First, the methodology. Secondly, reporting process. Thirdly, steps for developing GHG measuring and reporting system, and the existing tools as useful resources. I hope this element will be further elaborated and discussed in the following panel discussion session today. Next slide, please. In developing the guidelines, we are going to seek advice and suggestions from the experts around the world. I am sure that their professional input will be able to lead us to completion of the guidelines in a successful manner. Next slide, please. This is a timeline for the PASTI JIF phase two. I am looking forward to finalizing the draft guidelines with the input from the expert group, which I have shared with you right before, and also input through the international workshop in October next year. Next slide, please. In conclusion, 
I would like to summarize my presentation as follows. Number one, Pasty will be able to help private companies in extending their access to ESG financing opportunities with their upgraded corporate values in the global market. Secondary, Pasty program has been developed with two tracks regional-wide cooperation and bilateral cooperation. And thirdly, we are now in transition from phase one by developing a roadmap for facilities to phase two by developing guidelines. Final message from my presentation is our initiative in the Asian region will be further developed and our experience should be shared with other region beyond our region for our common goal, which is toward realizing a co-decarbonized future. Next slide, please. Finally, I would like to conclude my presentation by wishing you a fruitful discussion and session through your active participation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Moderator, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Takemoto. It is thrilling to know that we are gradually taking on a realizable shape of the M&R guideline. So these were the two keynote speeches. Thank you again. And please applause for both uh, key spe keynote speakers uh, who joined virtually. Thank you very much. <laughs> now it is time to move on to the panel discussion. Uh, may I ask Mr. Kato, the board member of OECC, uh, to uh, organize this panel discussion? Please pay attention to the podium now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nakajima-san. Um, my name is Makoto Kato from Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center, Japan. Now uh, we're going to dive um, into the uh, panel discussion. And um, first, as uh, Dr. Professor Takemoto mentioned, well, we are now in the process of developing uh, ASEAN guidelines for measurement and reporting of greenhouse gas emissions at the facility level. And um, we, are, uh, we have uh, consulted with ASEAN member states and stakeholders, and uh, we're happy to um, provide for some um, uh, uh, the status of progress um, of um, our efforts. And now I am going to um, make a very brief presentation regarding the table of contents of the ASEAN guidelines. So the screen, please. Uh, what you have on the screen um, is that well, the, the draft table of contents of ASEAN guidelines on uh, facility level greenhouse gas measurement reporting. The next slide, please. So uh, this is the uh, uh, very uh, small um, tip of, um, uh, for your consideration about the um, um, MNAR um, guidelines. Um, we are uh, having um, the, uh, this guideline after, um, through the um, activities of the um, JIF, um, Japan ASEAN um, Integration Fund for JIF um, activities um, and the, the second phase uh, for PASTI project. And we are uh, actually well developing um, guidelines for the uh, for the purpose of um, uh, for the purpose of um, um, promoting for the um, ASEAN members for domestic activities because many of them are now in the process of um, uh, having for like a, a carbon reporting system domestically. So that the uh, as for Japan has uh, uh, 20 years of um, carbon report mandatory carbon reporting system. Um, for for operationalization, so that the, we are coming up with the um, uh, this kind of like guidelines. So it, it uh, consists with uh, background and well methodologies and of measurement and reporting measurement uh, methodologies me, uh, measurement of greenhouse gases and common element of greenhouse gas reporting, and also common steps to be taken for developing um, reporting system. And then it, as an annex, so we are uh, having for the useful tools for um, GHG reporting system. The next slide, please. So as the background of and um, objectives for um, 
as um, has been mentioned well, by many um, uh, speakers um, in today, we would like to emphasize the benefit of introducing greenhouse gas reporting system. Um, it sounds like um, sort of like additional burden for um, for uh, quantification and reporting, but actually, well, um, it uh, um, enhances for the, um, for example, the greenhouse gas management um, by itself, but also um, it has a, a benefit of, um, of um, uh, visualizing well, the, their efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. And then, well, that actually opened the door for the, um, uh, for example, like external evaluation, uh, including well, the ESG investment um, by, uh, by investors. So the benefits um, should be uh, put forward in the first. And we are, uh, uh, we are also introducing like a standard procedures and frameworks for a greenhouse gas um, reporting system and a consistency with international standards and robustness. Um, as has been, been mentioned by Dr. Takemoto, and also common denominator for ASEAN member states, because ASEAN itself is in the process of integration, so that the um, uh, 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 companies actually will um, operating well, um, across different countries in, within ASEAN regions. Actually, well, um, they do not have any burden to respond to different reporting system. Um, 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 basically, well, they, they, if they have a same commonalities, well, they, they actually will um, reduce the burden of um, quantification of greenhouse gases. And then when it comes to the um, common protocol. The next slide, please. In target sectors and scopes, and also measurement and reporting um, um, emissions um, actions. Well, these were actually, well, most um, um, uh, protocols actually are already um, available, basically. So that the, we actually um, discussed the, uh, the prioritization of what kind of target sectors well, we are going to take up, and also scopes, and then measurement and reporting um, 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 steps. But the thing, thing is that, well, the ASEAN has a diverse um, um, economic development levels. Um, some of them are um, very um, highly uh, developed economy, uh, such as Singapore. And well, also, um, there are um, uh, least developed countries like well, Lao PDR, Cambodia, and also countries like Indonesia, which is very big. Um, um, economics and structures are very different, so um, we are uh, having for well, the, uh, the f sort of flexibility um, while uh, maintaining the, um, uh, the uh, commonality. The next slide, please. So um, how, um, then, then I think of the, um, we, we have like a different protocols already, so that the, what is the value addedness of having all this kind of um, ASEAN um, guidelines? Um, I have seen many different protocols for, which have um, measurement reporting for uh, methodologies. But what I have never ever seen is that how to develop well, this kind of system at the domestic uh, national institutions. I think well, this is very important. How we start off, like uh, for example, like uh, how Japan started for the development of the national reporting system. I think well, the um, now I am engaged in the uh, development of the national reporting system in Vietnam, for example, and then that requires like a law, legal um, structure development or, or those kind of things. So that the, this is also how uh, uh, what we are would like to um, um, actually uh, integrate. How we start off um, looking around for the existing legal um, systems because many countries are actually have like a um, energy reporting system already and also like a taxation system also quant uh, uh, like a uh, statistics system so that the well this needs to be actually consistent with those existing systems and also institutional arrangement one ministry actually cannot deal with this kind of things so that the um, um, having interministerial coordination system is uh, it's extremely important while reducing the burden of um, um, actually an end user of this system, which is uh, private sector people. And also um, private sector engagement is um, extremely important. Well, if the government is um, providing for this kind of system without the, uh, the views or, or, or the um, uh, interests of um, private sector people, this is not going to work. But uh, what we want to do is like a, to uh, provide maximum benefit of the private sector so that the private sector engagement is also uh, going to be uh, very important. The next slide, please. 
and then common steps so that the ASEAN, um, uh, the Jive project is actually well, developing well, this kind of guidelines by um, having well, in participation by ASEAN member states, different ministries, and also private sectors. But also we are having um, pilot study, um, like a model um, reporting by um, actual private sector companies. And so that we, we would like to show the basic schematic structures, um, uh, schematic re requirements, the roles and responsibility of different actors. The next slide, please. Um, what, what I actually uh, forgot to mention is uh, we are also trying to keep the scalability of um, this system because some of the governments are actually well, looking at the carbon pricing system, um, I mean well, emission trading system. Um, the recent revised so, um, uh, environmental protection law by Vietnam actually clearly um, 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 identify the, actually, well, the direction for the introduction of domestic emissions trading system. And then this one is going to be a fundamental infrastructure for them to move for the um, emissions trading system. So this is what we are having uh, um, with the uh, support by the Singaporean government and the Japanese government together with Asian, um, uh, ASEAN country uh, member states. Thank you very much. So um, now uh, we would like to um, invite uh, uh, the uh, uh, panelists and then could you show us um, uh, the guiding questions? So um, what we want to do is like we would like to have inputs um, also um, because we have a um, very rich um, uh, uh, profile of panelists so that we, we would like to invite panelists to the discussion to discuss and then we, we, we actually um, prepared like uh, the guiding questions or well, um, three of them are uh, actually what are steps for building a transparency system for climate actions by the private sector in Asia? Um, how do we increase incentives? for climate actions by the private sector in line with transparency um, efforts. And what can international cooperation cover the needs of um, ASEAN countries? Well, I think this is a very general uh, thing and that you can actually take it, um, take them as you want and then, um, then you can actually um, provide inputs. So um, having well, um, this guiding um, question, I would like to invite the panelists well, to come to the front and then we'll start um, engaging our discussion. Thank you very much. Um, now uh, we have we have uh, really um, uh, high-profile people um, uh, from all, the, all, all over the world. And I would like to uh, invite well, one by one, and then you can actually well, uh, start addressing well, what you want to respond to to the uh, guiding question, but also you can actually introduce uh, what you're doing um, and how you might be contributing uh, to, to, to this kind of um, discussion. Now I would like to um, um, start with uh, uh, Ms. Nicolette. Bartlett, uh, who is a Chief Impact Officer of CDP. Nicolette, can I um, have you um, to start um, um, your speech? Absolutely, and thank you for having me here. Um, so I think really exciting to see a whole conversation about something that we, as, you know, as geeks in the world of MRV, swim in, right? So CDP is the global disclosure platform for companies on environmental issues. We cover climate change, water, and forestry issues. We've been going for 20 years. Uh, we don't just have companies coming through our system. So at the moment, we have 14,000 companies representing about 65% of global market capitalization. So all over the world coming through our system. Um, we also have cities, states, and regions who, the, who report through the platform. So we have a data set that's quite unique. Um, and this world of reporting has been what we've swum, swum in, in, so, in for so long that we really know the value of it. I think the key thing to focus on for what needs to happen is that mandatory disclosure is already a thing, right? In 15 countries, they've either adopted it or they're about to adopt it. Um, we just saw the United Kingdom bring out not only the disclosure uh, um, regulations, but actually they're going to also move straight forward into transition planning. So that's quite a big step to go from, from a TCFD style re uh, mandatory disclosure process to full on transition plans. And we can go through that in a sec. 
So I think my first message is this is happening. It's already happening. And most companies, 65% of global market cap, are already on that journey and are very clear how to do a lot of this, right? So it's not a mystery to them. Um, our system is aligned with the TCFD, uh, which, as you know, will now become part of the IFRS standard, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which was launched here last week um, at the COP. And they used a framing, which I think is awful, but it's being used a lot at this COP, which is around the plumbing of the system is really coming together now. So you've got, you've got a, an accounting body, which over 100 nations governments work in that body and adopt the frameworks and standards that come from that into their national regulation, right? And that will have the TCFD. It will ensure it builds on what exists. So the TCFD, we have, we at CDP uh, ran the Climate Disclosure Standards Board for many years. That framework is being merged into the, TC, into the ISSB. We also have um, CDSB in the United States is being um, moved into it. So really the standards board is seeking to align with what exists and bringing it into one consolidated space. So my second message is that that's really key. Having something standardized, having something that builds on what already exists is really, really important. And this is moving. And I think I would, so we could have time for a discussion. I think I would just focus on one more thing. It's not just that, you know, corporate disclosures in the real economy have changed. You've seen significant movement in the sustainable finance system, right? And that's key, because because really we don't, ESG is brilliant, right? But what we actually want is not a growth of green finance. We need to green the finance system. The capital already exists. We don't need to make up more capital. We need to realign the current capital market system with the zero carbon trajectory, right? If we don't have a net zero world, and you've seen the finance institutions um, last week make significant net zero announcements. Now what we need to do is follow those up with accountability and transparency. You've seen the Secretary General from the United Nations make a statement that he will be setting up a net zero expert panel to really focus on that. You have the EU working with China, Japan, and many other nations on the, the taxonomies, the sustainable finance taxonomies system. And you have countries um, moving within the G7 towards a TCFD style disclosure. So I think this finance piece coming together with the real economy mandatory disclosure means we can move towards wiring that system um, as quickly as possible. I'll, I'll leave it there so we have time for a discussion. Thank you very much for that. That's fantastic for a start of. Um, 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 so that the uh, Nicolette, well, you're going to stop here, and then you're going to have um, more more to say after that. Or, do you okay. want to do it yeah. once, or do you yeah, want to yeah, move yeah. up and down the panel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, so that the um, okay, so um, now I would like to invite for um, uh, Nicholas Veningsen to um, also well, like a response to uh, Nicolette's, uh, you know. Uh, uh, submission. Um, uh, uh, Nicholas Veningsen, um, uh, he's the manager of the engagement team of the United Nations uh, Framework Commission um, on Climate Change Secretariat. Nicholas, please. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here and, and uh, congratulations to, to this past project. I think it's both you know, timely and, and very much needed. So my name is Nicholas Fennington. I'm manager for the Global Climate Action part of UNFCCC, uh, which basically means everything that has been over, going on over in the hydro in these two weeks, plus uh, a little bit more. Uh, but basically what we are trying to do in my team is to engage what we call non-party stakeholders, almost everybody who is not a negotiator in taking climate action, because it's clear to us that the political process and negotiations, the commitments by countries is absolutely necessary, but it's not enough. We need to get everybody on board. And that is really our job, and our job together with everybody else, of course, to do that. So um, I'm going to save a few things uh, um, until the discussion, but just in a, in a nutshell, uh, when it comes to reporting and transparency, um, it's 
well, I shouldn't say it's easy, but it's relatively easy to get reporting from countries under the transparency framework that we have under UNFCCC. Um, Non-party stakeholders, especially the private sector, of course, do not have that kind of a re direct relation or representation in our process. So what we have been doing is to try to encourage in different way these non-party stakeholders to take action and to register their commitments with us. So we have something we call the Global Climate Action Portal, GCAP, where we today have registered some 26,000 commitments from uh, private sector, cities, regions, even countries, uh, and international organizations who in different ways are uh, addressing their climate footprints, both on the mitigation side and on adaptation side and on the finance side. So it's really all encompassing. And I have a lot of views and experience from, from this that I would like to share. I think I'll stop here so we can get a good discussion going. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so that the, uh, I think oh, you have more to say um, after this. And, okay. Okay. Uh, and then, sure. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, may, I, may I have like a, uh, Marisan first, maybe, or, or Dan, Dan, do you want to go first? I can. I, I can okay, go first. so that. Okay, so oh, yeah. um, I would like to. Just like a lot of. Oh, okay, that's a yeah. that's a great order. Uh, so, could you introduce yourself first of all? Yeah. So my name is uh, Dan Pathambanich. I'm CEO of NRF. We're so we're publicly listed in Thailand. Um, uh, somewhat. Uh, of an outsized actor in terms of like what we're trying to do in terms of climate, specifically from Thailand. So, not coming from a multilateral or organization, um, but very involved. So, you know, our our purpose really is how do we um, decarbonize through food system transformation, and essentially what we're doing is pushing alternative protein, um, plant-based meats, as that's like the easy kind of ask for people to help fight climate change and we're building capacity around the world. Um, but then on a um, non-commercial basis, you know, we're funding grants, um, impact investments um, in the US, in Europe, etc. on this. And so uh, I, I won't go specifically into kind of like the frameworks. So that's, that's, that's not why I'm here. But I, I would like to maybe provide a voice from a private sector or public sector perspective. And so I think the, the first challenge, I think, as a public company, um, and even amongst different public companies is, is because, you know, we, we have, you know, I have a full team, like a dozen people or more in sustainability just focusing on reporting, compliance, what we can do, outreach, grants, etc. cetera. Um, and even against other public companies who, who are not climate oriented, even within our own sector, within our peer group, um, it's almost like an unfair kind of like, you know, we've got higher fixed costs. And, and so I, I think that's the first challenge is how do you get within, within listed companies um, buy-in, right? Um, e even though you've got ESG funds, um, uh, funds move, transitioning towards ESG, but then how do you get within at least the public markets, all the listed companies, right, to be more climate oriented? Um, within Thailand, the SEC now has asked, at least within the set 100 index, like the so top 100 market capitalized companies, to all report now sustainability reports. And then I think we're going to move to full reporting across every listed company. But I think to your point, I think all non-listed companies with, for example, a certain size, like $10 million and above um, in revenue should disclose, right? Um, into like an easy database. I think the problem now, it's too complex, there's too many standards, there's too many kind of like, how do you do this, what do you do that? It's not friendly, especially from a developing country or especially a least developing country um, context. So I think that's, that's very problematic. And I can tell you right now, coming from specifically from Thailand, and you know, we have operations in other countries as well, um, I think the awareness around climate and why they should even bother doing sustainability reports and you know, what is net zero is largely elusive. So I think to get the, to, the, to the transparency mechanism, I think all, so all the top 100 companies, they've all got full teams doing it. So I think that's not even an issue, right? It's kind of like, the the I, I would say 95% of the other emitters, right, in um, in in probably most countries, right, the SMEs, um, that are probably largely responsible. I'll give you a very quick example. So, um, from an auditing perspective, as a food company, we're already audited on sustainability by all our supermarket clients, right, and they're very thorough. I mean, they'll audit all the way down to where we're dumping our waste, right, and so. Um, and in that instance, we're audited by multiple multiple um, parties. Um, um, but you know, if you're if you're not listed and you're not within the food sector, you know, I think there's 
I, I mean, it, it, so I, I, I think from a transparency perspective, I think, yeah, the, the SME sector needs to get involved. And then very clear kind of like going back to this, sec this issue on incentives, um, I think the incentives has to be cl more clear just um, defined with kind of local, maybe local champions, private sector companies who have actually made a feasible case against why they should be doing this. And I think that will result in people wanting to do this and then also then resulting them wanting to be transparent because the pricing mechanism will be there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, it's it's really good to have your real voice from from the you know business operators. And now I am also inviting uh, uh, Miss Mari Yoshitaka. Mari Sang is my old friend, and also Long she's uh, one of the leaders for um, in this world. Um, um, she has she has invested invested a lot of time for um, leading uh, the Japanese community and Japanese companies um, to to move for sustainability. And now she's doing more. And today, well, I'm very happy to have her as the uh, the uh, the deputy manager, general manager, um, principal sustainability strategist uh, of Mitsubishi Research and Consult. Think are limited. So, Marisan, please. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, actually, I have been involved in the environmental finance more than 20 years now. And I start with that emission uh, carbon credit generated from the developing countries, including Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Then now, um, uh, just a couple of years ago, the suddenly the Japanese investors uh, came to the ESG investment. And then uh, because of the Japanese government changed their uh, policy uh, to disclose the, all the information uh, by the listed companies, uh, just 2015. Since then, the, my job has changed. And now uh, I work for the Mitsubishi UHJ banks and the Mitsubishi UHJ Morgan Standard Securities to provide uh, those, uh, uh, you know, uh, world trend of the disclosure, uh, information disclosure in terms of invest investors. Or not only the listed company, but also the unlisted company. Because uh, in Japan, the supply chain, uh, especially for the automobile uh, industry, Supply chain is so big, and the ones that uh, you know Toyota mentions. Okay, in, in June, the Akio Toyota, president of the Toyota, mentioned that they are going to reduce the three percent of the carbon emission from the parts of the supply chain of their industry. It's so huge impact for us. And then, and the ones that the announcements made, as for local government and the local SMEs, so shocked, and they ask me that what's going on there. But uh, you know, only the listed company know about the ESG investment and uh, why they have to disclose the information. And then um, I sometimes uh, talk with the local government as well as SMEs in Japan, why you need this. And I like to talk about uh, more deeply uh, today. And I'm very happy to discuss with especially you guys. You know, and so you know, have a very simple. You know, very good friendship in Thailand because I had lots of big projects in Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rani San. Um, I think it's, it's a really exciting moment for, for Japanese um, uh, companies, but also um, our partners for in Asia uh, region. So that the uh, I think you have you have um, embarked with a new chapter of the, your 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 uh, work. Thank you very much. Now. Um, Coming back to Nicolette, um, so um, maybe well, you have lots of um, uh, um, inputs um, um, and uh, also some some response for to, to to your argument. So, but I would like to uh, having having the, those for discussion. What what do you um, suggest? Yeah, thank you. I think. First of all, really proud to be uh, the data partner for the Global Climate Action Platform. Uh, I think it's been a really important, since it evolved from the NASCAR platform, it's really, really critical. And I think this COP is all about that building in the robust and transparency mechanisms that we need for the non-state act to work so that it can align and can eventually find some way of synergizing with the country frameworks. Couldn't agree more about the different stages and the different types of companies. Um, we have, you know, I think it's safe to say with, I think Japan is the fifth most covered uh, set of companies that disclose through our system, right? So it's like 887, whereas in the ASEAN region, we have only 336, right? Still starting the journey, but some of them obviously being, having been part of it for quite some time. Mm -hmm. 
Japan also is, you know, has the highest number of TCFD supporters, right? So I think we're kind of grooving in at a very high level for the big multinationals. And now we need to layer it to the next. And I think from our perspective, one of the ways in which we're trying to help with that is we've built partnerships with several governments around the world to help use our system to underpin or support what they are doing on this kind of thing, right? But secondly, to build that capacity building for companies, which is so critical, take them on a journey, have them understand what stage of the journey they're at and why that's important. Um, and SMEs, that's been one of the key topics of this COP. Everywhere I've been, we've actually had the SMEs in the room for the first time, and usually it's been dominated by multinationals. And I think it's extraordinary. And what's really extraordinary is you, so we've built a framework recently that makes it much simpler for SMEs, because of course our questionnaire is a nightmare for companies to fill in, right? It's a complete nightmare. <laughs> so, so you need like a scroll people, I apologize in advance. But um, the, the uh, and, and that's because of the drivers of it, right? So this, this incentives is the key. So our system started with, um, having institutional investors, right? So institutional investors, we now, they represent some stupid amount of trillions, 505 of them, that ask companies to disclose through our system. So we're your shareholder, please use CDP system, we need to use your data, please set a science-based target, etc. But we also have, for the last 10 years, brought together the big buyers of the world, right? Which includes major governments, the Japanese government, the federal government of the United States, so their procurement mechanisms, but also Walmart, right? Some of the biggest retailers in the world who come into the system um, to, to work with their supply chain because they know their supply chain is their biggest issue. Now, what have we found? That drives way more disclosure than the institutional investor, and particularly in the emerging markets. Why? Your client asks you. Then another client asks you. What are you going to do? Say no, right? But of course, the story, the, the journey they go on is a little bit further behind at first. And so we have to then build mechanisms in. And the companies then work with their supply chain and give them on a certain journey. And if they, for example, we have a scoring system. So we score a system, it goes into Bloomberg terminals, into Quick terminals, into other places, into data sets for investors. And that scoring on a journey incentivizes the company, right? But what we then do is work, for example, with supply chains. Um, we work with some, some big banks, create sustainability-linked loans, and they, if they get a certain, as they move up the CDP score, which means they disclose better and better, they take better strategy, strategic decisions, they have better targets, they get a better uh, credit rating or, you know, drop 10 uh, percentage points on their, I mean, 0.10 percentage points, right, tiny, but it really matters. It really matters to people. So I think I couldn't agree also more about champions, right? So, and, and the fact that it's not just about listed companies. So in the supply chains of many companies are mostly, you know, companies that are private. So we've also started to work with private equity to try and big some of those big private companies into the system. We've also working with banks with their lending portfolios. That's when you really start to cover the economy in so many different ways to try and bring them into the system. Um, I would just end with one thing. I think it's a very simple journey that we've ultimately um, seek to align on, and I think it's alignment that's happening now across the system, and I, and, and I agree it's been really complicated, and they've had that dreadful alphabet of standards out there. That's aligning now. There really is. Our system will completely adopt the ISSB standards and ensure that they are basically implemented at scale globally very quickly, because investors still want that standardized, consistent data set, and this makes it so much easier for us to actually align and ask a much simpler set of metrics because it's aligned with whatever the global system is. But those journey for me is step one on a journey when a company's just starting, you're just measuring. You're just learning to measure, right? And it's just knowing what the right metrics to measure. That's the key. And that's different for different uh, environmental areas. Number two, it's about your governance system changing. It's about your strategy and it's about your forward looking. So you do scenario analysis. Essentially, that's the TCFD step, right? And that's a big step that, that happened in the last few years. The next step is you set a target 
And in the most rational world, you will set a science-based target that's aligned with a 1.5 degree world. Because what other world is it that you think you're going to be selling your products and services in, right? So that's the next step. And we have a standard for that, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which we've been working really closely with other NGOs to run. Um, and with the UN Global Compact, it's, standard, it's got official standards for that. It's a really useful way to make, make those standards look the same and make those targets match different sectors. And there's a net zero standard for that now as well. And then finally, the next two steps is where we're at now, and that's transition plans. How do you plan to meet it? What, are the, what is your OPEX plan? What are your CAPEX plans to align with your target? How do we know you're really going to do it in the next five years? Because the next five years is all that matters, actually. Net zero by 2050 is fantastic, but we've got eight years to halve emissions. So, like, the next five years is what really matters. And finally, we need to see companies, well, we need to start creating the systems in place at CDP, within um, all the other institutes working on this, to track performance over time. Are you meeting your targets, right? But that's, that's the kind of leading edge of it all. So I'll stop there and hand over. That's really exciting. And the you know, funny, funny thing is like a nightmare for many. Could, could, could be a nightmare, but uh, <laughs> we, we need to ask you to survive all this nightmare thing to a bright future um, with sustainability. Um, now, um, I have actually well, one um, person who wants to uh, uh, raise a question uh, from the floor. May I, may, may I um, have you introduce, yes. um, introducing yourself? You know? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Halliday. And I work with an organization called the Clean Capitalist Leadership Council, and we have an initiative called Climate and Freedom. Uh, one thing that I would just like to say about standardization is having the output and all of the data rows and data columns output in the same format. Sometimes you get PDF, sometimes you get Word, sometimes you get CSV. You guys can't even get it into one format, that's going to be a log jam for everyone. That's step one, easy. The other thing, however, with all of these carbon disclosure requirements is the acknowledgement that it's so much more difficult for companies to hire the people to even understand what they're doing to get through your own questionnaire, which I believe you called Twisted? <laughs> no, no, difficult. Difficult. It's okay. long. <laughs> it's complex. <laughs> complex. complex and so it's um, important to uh, not use this as a club on people because it's going to take some time to learn, and all of these companies are going to have to increase their expense, not only to hire additional workers to be able to figure out the disclosure, but also to maintain existing operations while simultaneously buying and transferring into the new system. So for a period of the overlap, their emissions are most likely going to increase, but yet your standardization can be used as a penalty if they have a bad score. How do you address this? Okay, so I, Nicolette. Or, I'll be yeah, very Nicolette, yeah, yeah, please. And then yeah, I yeah. think we no, should no, no, have no, the no, other please, panelists. You, yeah. Okay. Oh. Let's uh, you can start, and then maybe well some other can. Yeah, pick yeah. Up, why yeah. don't we hand over? Does okay. anyone else want to answer that? Question mm. to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll answer. Good way. <laughs> so I think the first thing to say is 65% of global market cap are already doing this, right? A lot of what they are measuring. They have the systems in place to do it. Now, this is not some new expense for them. It's, in, it's an existing infrastructure. Number two, the world, the transition we're on is absolutely huge, right? So there isn't a world where you can do that with a light touch person with a clipboard in the back of the room filling in three questions. They're, they're just, that's just not the world we're in. So when I say it's complex, it's, because it should, it's not because we're trying to make it complex, but it's because it is a complex issue. And some of those questions are designed to trigger, we, no one knows the answer. So they're trying to, it's trying to trigger a, a different conversation. And other questions are deliberately designed to align with existing structures. So the TCFD, most of our questionnaire is just completely aligned with the TCFD now. So the TCFD is the one that has made that recommendation on behalf of a series of corporates, financial institutions, and ultimately it's being moved into regulation. So 
we're not making something extra up. We've literally aligned the questionnaire with that. The scoring we found to be the most useful way to help companies along the journey. Interestingly, the people who care about the schools more are the companies. They really, really care about the companies and it's about their schools because they, they even have incentives linked to it, right? They're very proud of it when they get an A. And the, and the aim in that is not to penalize, but to pull into the journey towards the A. Not many companies end up in that A list, but the point is to get companies along a journey. And many, many companies stay in the D, Cs, and Bs for quite some time. But they know then what they need to do to move forward. It's, it's, it's simply what we believe is, is um, I suppose, the role we set ourselves in the absence of a global system. We created this one, but it is not based on something that we now are making up. It is entirely aligned with existing standards out there. Great. Okay. Anybody? Um, okay. Nick, Nicholas, please. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, uh, related to this question, I think what, what we have learned in our work is that there are basically three questions that you need to understand and when it comes to disclosure, and that is why, what, and how. And, and the why is really, you know, every journey starts with knowing where you are. We know where we are going. As Nicolet said, we are going to 2050 net zero, but really where, what we know need to do very quickly to get our you don't need to know every single ton and every single source to do that. You don't need to have the perfect picture from the start. But you need to start somewhere. And you also need to accept that it's going to cost. You know, this idea of that, oh, we're going to take climate action, <clears throat> it's not going to impact our baseline. Of course it's going to do. But it's much better than the alternative where we have a runaway climate change that completely destroys business. So that is why the what then, that what we are using quite a lot is, um, to see the scope, what do you look? You have the greenhouse gas protocol scope one, two, three, and what we're using in our fashion charter, in our sports framework, in our tourism and our aviation initiatives, is really to try to include scope three as much as possible, which means that you're not only looking at your own company, you're looking at your suppliers. So you get the multiplying effect. The ambition may be lower there, but just to get them starting to, to measure and, and calculate the, the footprint. And the third one is how. And I, I have to admit that in, in UNFCCC, we find CDP being excellent. So we are really referring a lot to CDP and we are asking, you know, over time to adopt the standards and, and the reporting framework and that. And I do want to say that CDP is one of many, many organizations that are basically using a very similar framework for reporting. And as, as you said, what we want to do is to make this compatible with the government and national reporting over time. So we're moving in that direction. And I don't think there's a lot of, you know, disagreement on what needs to be reported, only how much and how fast. Thank you very much, Ro. That's that's really um, good uh, response. And Dan San, uh, can I have your? I think you're yeah. you're actually well, um, uh, sprinting to the airport after this. Yes. So yeah. I have I have a four o'clock flight. So I'm gonna have to leave at two thirty exactly. Okay. So that you can you can you can, uh, I can provide your a, final comment. Yeah, yes. Maybe I can have a, a final comment. So um, I, I want to just touch up on a few a few points um, that was that was raised. Uh, so so I think the first thing is at least we need the. I would, let, let me call it the informal sector to start on this journey. So if it doesn't start, then that's problematic, right? Um, I think the second thing is, um, I think it was your comment on, on private equity, or was it your comment? I forgot. Um, so we actually funded this program um, to review how, how because I, I come from the private equity world, right? So we used to own some funds. I used to have a private equity fund that exited that business for impact. So no more hat on that. Um, and I, I think that's VCs and private equity are the best levers to engage in the like the non-listed companies, right? Um, but I think what needs to be reassessed is the way that they're managed, uh, uh, measured in terms of their performance and how they measure their portfolio companies. So I'll give you a good, a good example. In a previous life, and no more, I was in a we we, uh, we had a poultry company, right? And like the key measure of success was your food conversion rate, how fat you can make an animal, right? And obviously, there's no climate deforestation at all variables in, um, calculated within this common metrics that's employed by all funds around the world, right? And so with very simple kind of like re reassessing how they measure their portfolio company performance, um, you could immediately impact, for example, like complete supply chains, right? In terms of like, no, you don't need to fatten a chicken within like, you know, 30 weeks, for example, right? Um, unless you're willing to do this, this, and this, or you have that, right? Um, 
And I think also what's really beneficial, I think coming from a you know, VC private equity um, hat in terms of, um, I think the transparency will always be there anyways. That's all aligned, right? But then how do you get their entire portfolios? Like, so we have one investor that, that does that. So they require mandatory reporting, right? But it's not clear what kind of reporting standards they want. Right, so that, that is not aligned as well, right? Even though they're a major fund, which I won't disclose, okay? But they're great, I love them. Um, and um, so I think with, with, with that, I think there's a few things. I would say um, on this last point on incentives, I think for us, you know, we're looking at different methods, for example, like biochar um, within, Th within Thailand, for example, even here in the UK, for example. So I've been meeting with, with many companies how we could um, instigate that as a potential carbon sink. Um, I think the problem is, um, which I think the US does very well. So you've got different departments providing different grants. And so if you're a first mover willing to put risk capital against the most innovative technologies, right, um, and, and just put it out there, and then having matching grants, because I think there's so much money out there. So I don't think it's a fight for liquidity or, or literally financial incentives. I think it's more of a fight for how do you get that first at risk proved as feasible. Once it's feasible, then there's so much money around, right? There's the abundant liquidity. So if you, can, if, if you can solve that first point, I think that goes more than, say, for example, subsidized interest rates or you know, whatever. I think that, that, that's a better lever for, for, from a private sector perspective anyways. Um, and then I, think, I just think from an international context, I think, um, from a food agro perspective, because that's one third of emissions, I think if you push the supermarkets, right? I hate to say it because I manufacture for hundreds of supermarkets, right? But they are the most important lever, right? And they, but I, I think it's two-sided, multifaceted issue, but I'll just address two. So you push the supermarkets, um, almost every supplier within say a, a Walmart supply chain will align. They'll have to, right? But the problem is when they do that, and they would love to do it, right? And the problem is, is um, they will say, well, there's no price increases. Yeah. That's what kills everybody. Kills, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take the, 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 the hat, the, the cut, because you know, we're mission, you know, we're half mission focused. Um, but there's a lot of companies who won't, right? And that's, that's a problem. So I think, how do you get true food cost of accounting across these supply chains, Agreed. right? To, to pass through and not just like, okay, well, Marmark says you need to do this, but there's no price increases. That, I think that's the most difficult. But then if Walmart requires it, the transparency frameworks will come if Walmart demands it. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I really have to go. Dan, Dan, okay, okay. So thank you. Dan, Dan, thank you. Dan is actually <laughs> sprinting to the Glasgow um, so Airport. Okay. Thank you very much for your participation. But uh, please, please uh, uh, be reminded that you're going to be already in the in the loop, so that the, we are we are going to continue our discussion in future. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a safe flight to Bangkok. Okay, um, now uh, Madison, so that it's, um, we have lots of um, inputs, um, um, arguments, so what, what do you respond to? Um, do you have any, do, do you want to um, uh, use your... Yes. Actually, I really, really agree with Dan mentioned, mm -hmm. yeah? especially in Japan, that uh, compared to the US Western countries, the uh, Com between the companies and the banks, uh, relationship very strong. Not to the in, with the capital market, and that's why the, uh, my, background, my background is comes from the Mitsubishi USA Bank, and I talked with the local banks uh, to let them know that the, what's the ESG investment is, but uh, they don't know anything, even in Japan. So I. I totally agree with uh, Dan that, uh, you know, once that, uh, for example, Apple, uh, you know, push stress out the Japanese company to reduce the carbon emission to using the, to use the renewable energy 100%, it's not workable. Because uh, in Japan, that uh, you know, uh, ratio of the wholesale fuels in the grid is so high that they, their cost for us SMEs uh, to provide uh, such uh, equipment to the Apple is so hard for them. Then some of the companies move to the Philippines to produce that uh, equipment. So of course we can push the government to, to you know increase the renewables, but the only one company cannot do anything. Yeah. So uh, just uh, uh, I, what I doing to the local com government and SMEs are uh, maybe just the third uh, slides. In, no, in the upper case, definitely the 
more than 20 or 30 Japanese companies already uh, and, you know, correspond to that uh, requirement by the Apple. Uh, and then, but the local, you know, local SMEs or uh, you know the venture capitals in the, uh, 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 in Japan, they don't know much about the knowledge about investment, uh, ESG investment, also the importance of the carbon uh, uh, information disclosure. So I ask that the local finance uh, to to you know support that the local SMEs and also that the local SMEs to know that uh, how much in, invest, ESG investment is necessary for them to attract the investment, especially for the uh, aligning with that the major company, listed company in, Jap in Japan, to tell them the story of the SMEs, how they can you know already uh, measure that uh, you know carbon uh, emission and so on. So on. then this is kind of an investment chain for them. And I just put the, the international finance here because of the, today we talk about the Asian countries matter. So then I believe that the local government and the local um, uh, supporters, especially in the SDGs, may support those, uh, uh, you know, build that those framework to you know uh, encourage the people uh, to know about the importance of the carbon. And next, please. next slide. Uh, especially in Japan, the, because of the uh, uh, relationship between the banks, you know, the indirect finance and uh, uh, industry is so strong. That's why we, don't, we have not disclosed the information well in the past. Because our relationship between the capital market is so low, then uh, this is a kind of now I just uh, studied about the outcome from the older history in the Western countries. In the Western countries, the, they uh, you know inst install the low carbon pricing to improve the valuation of the low carbon business by the financiers. Then they also install the tax incentive feed subsidy for the government, and they uh, incentives for the bank. In, in, in general, then also the you know like CDP, the international standard, the pressure from the international customers is a very actually crucial for us now. Before that, uh, actually we don't realize much. We didn't realize much such a you know framework for that. Then the now financial institutes in Japan is blessed by those you know background. Now the kedan like that now move forward. So that's the kind of a framework is necessary for the other, any other countries who has not you know, established the information disclosure. That's Thank fantastic. You Thank you very much for, for, for your, um, uh, so she actually prepared for this um, um, slide in a very frank manner, but that she, she actually had a very strong um, um, idea about this. And then um, really, well, it's happening in Japan. And then what we want to see is that, well, this is also happening for in Asian, ASEAN countries for the next five years, because many of them actually will, um, um, the country announced uh, 2050 carbon neutrality then people say, wow, but uh, what, what they need to do is, of course, so the government needs to do something, but also the private sector, including SMEs. Well, I think what this is, and also this needs to be sustainable, not, not necessarily only like uh, pushing like uh, obliga obligatory uh, matters, but also um, the business needs to actually well, um, um, uh, get the benefits and um, um, profits. So this is what we are expecting for in future, and that maybe we're having this uh, inputs for perhaps for um, two of you or may um, provide for the final response. Okay, Nicolette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can. Oh, you want to? No, do no, no. Okay. I'm good. I'm yeah, just final. worrying about the time. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Final, final comment. Yes, please. Okay, well, I, I just think it's been a great pleasure. I couldn't agree more that once you get the banks involved, it's a very, 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 very different proposition. And I think what central bankers are doing right now through the network for greening the finance system is one of the single most exciting, even if extremely dull, but extremely exciting and most powerful thing. Right. Because it triggers such a result. Um, because banks ultimately are the, the financial institutions that are really embedded right across the economy. And now that they themselves have to do their own measuring, and they're so far behind the real economy, they really are in terms of measuring and managing. We have banks that in our last uh, disclosure to us, less than half of them have even started to assess the impact of their portfolio on climate. 
less than half, right? 25% of them have only started to disclose those emissions now. Think about the real economy has been doing it for 20 years. The banks are only starting. I'm not saying it's not complex for them. It certainly is. And they need data, of course. But it's once they start kicking in, the whole system, I think, can, can realign really quickly. So I'll leave with that. Yeah. But, and uh, Nicholas. Your final comments. Right. I actually want to echo everything everybody have already said here. Uh, I, I just think, and I, I want to end where I started, I, I think the uh, positive product is doing something that is very much needed. Um, we ha need to have this kind of capacities. We need to have this kind of, of I, I hesitate to call it standard, but guidelines, you know, commonalities between different climate actors so that we can compare them to each other and more important that they can compare themselves to other and identify where are the problems and what can to do about it. So congratulations to uh, o o OECC <laughs> for doing this and, and to Japan and, and all the best of luck. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, nice comments. And then I think uh, we, although we want to continue with this discussion, but uh, um, uh, now um, time's um, uh, very short so that the, we would like to wrap this up discussion. Thank you very much for um, excellent participants for um, very good contribution um, today. Thank you. So thank you very much from my side also. It was very, very intensive panel discussion. And I, uh, so, yeah, we still want to keep listening to those discussions. But unfortunately, all the good things come to the end. And we have to close this event. Thank you, everybody, again. So please applause to the everybody, keynote speakers and panelists. And also, they aren't going anymore, but to the ministers also. So. Now, um, this concludes the past COP26 side event. And thank you very much for your participation. It was very nice finally to see someone in person. I, I hope that we can keep going this way. And next time, we see more other people in this venue or other, pa other part of time. Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimashita.